So my name is Christian Saylor, and if you are here for technologies that are revolutionizing the education industry, you are in the right place. Um, so uh, as any good, um, you know, my background is in uh, user experience design. So um, as any good designer, sort of want to get to know the audience a little bit. So how many are, are actual educators, teachers here? Okay, what about developers? Okay. And everyone else. <laughs> so great. So you're in the right place. So what I wanted to do is to let you um, in on a little bit of like who I am, some of the things that, that really sort of make me tick um, and the things that, that I really gravitate towards. So, so as we get going, you'll, you'll learn and sort of explore a little bit of me, but this is really about education and sort of the future of education and really technologies that are revolutionizing the education industry. I'd actually rather call that ideas that are revolutionizing the education industry because as you start digging deep into the technology thing, the technology is sort of just the enabler, but it's really about that, that story, about that idea and what we're trying to really uh, accomplish um, in the education um, system. So, just like I said, a little bit about myself. A couple of things that I, I really gravitate towards. I gravitate towards furniture, furniture design. I'm a furniture brat, actually. Um, my, my father owns a furniture company in the um, furniture capital of the world, which is Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, he owns a company called Izzy Design, which is actually named after my youngest daughter. Um, but I have affinity for, for my whole entire life on furniture and the design of furniture. So does anybody know? We're going to be tested throughout this thing, so, <laughs> right? So we're, anyone know what piece of furniture this is? Ah, a chair. A chair. <laughs> It is iconic, one of the most iconic pieces by Charles Henry Eames, and this is actually called the Eames Lounge Chair. Another thing that I really, really, really gravitate towards is architecture. Does anyone know, first and foremost, the designer or architect for this? Gary? 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 Frank Gary, yes. One point. So th there, are, there are rewards. So does anyone actually know where this building is located? This is in Las Vegas, Nevada. If anyone's been there, it's in Las Vegas. So this is actually a, a brain medical institute um, that Frank Gehry did. So the reason that I really gravitate towards this is just his use of, of texture and materials and the way he sort of uses titanium which not many people do as a, um, a building or a cornerstone of a lot of his designs, like the one in Spain, which is the Bilbao um, in Spain, which is one of my favorite pieces of architecture. And then the last piece that I really, really gravitate towards is, is automotive. Um, I absolutely love beautiful automotive design um, from the classics, which does anyone know what brand of car this is? This is, this is a Porsche, you're right. You're right. What's that? 356. A 356. Yeah, so he gets two points. <laughs> so one point over here, two over here, see me after class. The gauntlet has been laid down. Right, the gauntlet has been laid down. So, so there's, there's those three things. So there, there's furniture, architecture, and automotive design that for my whole life I've really, really gravitated towards. There's a beauty around that, but there's one thing, one thing that actually connects these three things together. And in fact, I would say it connects everything together. It connects us. It connects inanimate objects. The thing that I gravitate towards the most is a great story. All right, looks like it's a battle between one and two. What, what, who is this? Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. All right, great. So I, I love a great story. Now, when I, when I grew up, Star Wars was, was rampant in our house. I mean, it was like, it was sort of the cult classic film before it was even a cult classic film. This, this movie, my older brother memorized every single word to the movie. And that's why I hated it. <laughs> because I, I couldn't sit down and actually enjoy watching 
it wasn't until I got married and moved out and sort of started my, my own life and this really sort of became this cult following where I'm like, okay, l let me watch it now by myself. And I really gravitated towards it because it was a really, really, really great story. And I think the older ones are, are way better than the new ones. But, so stories. Stories connect everything together, right? It connects us. It connects inanimate objects. Just like I said, it, it connects us to something so much bigger. So, any great story, any great story, be it a book, be it a movie, there is four main components that sort of make up a great story. Is there any English teachers here by any chance? One. All right. So if you don't get this, you're in big trouble. So let's bring it back to sort of English 101. So four main characteristics. I'll, I'll get us started. So all great stories start with a lead character. So for all great stories, there must be a, a lead character, someone that you sort of have this intimate connection with from the beginning to the end of the story. As the page turns, as the movie progresses, you get to know sort of the, what we call the backstory of who this character actually is. Because long term, it gives us a little bit of empathy for what they're going through if we sort of have an intimate connection with, with who they are. So we have lead character. Then we go into ambition. So ambition gives our lead character a purpose, a motivation within the story. It's sort of like what makes that person, that thing tick. So then we'll understand long term when we start flipping more pages and more chapters or progressing deeper into the movie. We'll understand why that character is acting the way they are, why they're making specific kind of gestures, it's because we understand what their ambition is. So once we understand who they are, we understand their ambition, then what happens? We got lead character, ambition, then conflict. So as the chapters turn, as the movie gets a little bit longer, all of a sudden the lead character in our story comes to a halt or some diversion in the path of, of the story, right? And, and for Luke Skywalker, there's, there's a couple of those conflicts that happen throughout the lifespan of that story. Conflict has a potential of diverting us in directions that we know, in directions that are unforeseen at that critical moment. So we've got lead character, ambition, conflict, and then everybody said resolution. resolution. All right, two to two. So lead character, ambition, conflict, and resolution. Resolution is sort of born out of the conflict. So resolution gives us a new starting point, the end of the story or a new beginning. That's why for Star Wars, there's like, how many, how many, Star Wars movies are there now? I mean, there, there's a lot. Or, more appropriately, Halloween. How many are they up to now? I don't even know. But the resolution just is a new beginning. So the story that I want to tell you today is a story about me. This is me. I'm the lead character in this story. And as we progress through, you'll start to understand how all these things and the story points start connecting to technologies and how technology is actually revolutionizing the education industry. So if we sort of step back a little bit and look at the lead character of a story, when you start sort of looking at my life and the things that make me tick to understand that backstory as the chapter keeps unfolding, I'm a competitive, competitive individual. From sports to academics to design, I always want to be first. I want to be the best. I am very competitive. It's just part of my nature. And if you knew my dad, you would know exactly where I got that competitive nature from. I love to write. It's a great expression. I love to draw. It's another creative outlet for who I am as a person. 
especially I love drawing Batman, at least when I was that age. A knack for playing music and probably the biggest one of all, annoys a family at every single opportunity to do magic tricks. So when I was nine years old, I would spend hours creating these stories because I thought I was gonna be the next David Copperfield or Penn and Teller. So that was sort of who I was growing up. And, and I gotta tell you, from a very early on age, I absolutely hated math. That, that was like my Darth Vader. That was my arch nemesis. Math was something, even to this day, when someone says those four letter, that four letter word, it sort of shrivels me a little bit because there was a history there that was very negative for me um, in growing up. School is boring except for sports, girls, and gym class. That was my reason for going to school, are, are basically those, those three things, sports, girls, and gym class. Very competitive, so the sports thing was just, was just very, very much a part of who I was. And as you can see from a very you know, early age, I had a bat in my hand or kicking a ball or, or something. I was, I was extremely, extremely competitive. So now that you know a little bit about me as sort of the lead character in this story, we sort of go to that part of ambition. So you know a little bit who I am. Now, now what sort of motivates me? Well, again, in any great story, you start undercovering sort of that lead character. You'll understand, again, I'm a competitive person. So what I want to do, I wanted to be the best at everything I did. So what ended up happening is I started winning at, at a, a lot of sporting events. When I was, so, so does anyone know what sport this is just by looking? Soccer. Okay, that's a negative one point. <laughs> so just by looking at the, at the door. Racquetball. racquetball. So for most of you, you probably don't, you know, don't even know racquetball, but in the 70s and 80s, that was like, you know, it wasn't like tennis and all that kind of stuff. It, it was racquetball. And, and I was on actually adult leagues when I was, when I was 12. And so it, until my dad was like, you're, you're going into high school here pretty soon and they don't have racquetball in high school. Maybe you should try tennis. So that's when I sort of started my you know, tennis career. But at the age of 12, I went to States and won racquetball. <laughs> And I had sort of this Superman complex very, very early on that I could actually leap tall buildings in a single bound. I mean, it was possible because that's, that's what I was doing. I was, I was winning. I was competitive in every aspect of my life. And even to this day, that's the one thing my wife absolutely hates about me is I'm competitive, except for like in board games. She's got me covered on that one. She is like really competitive in board games. But I had this, I had this superhero you know, complex, and I, I really started building up this, this personal empire, um, the way that I thought about myself, the things that I, I was right now, and the things that, that I could be. And I was just straight for that target. I knew exactly what I wanted to be. And what I wanted to be was exactly what my dad um, was. I didn't want to be like my dad. He was, he was a designer, a furniture designer. So I was like, you know, I'm going to be a racquetball player and a magician. That's, that's the trajectory of my life right there. I got a great career path. Um, so as the story goes. So, so I built up sort of this, this personal empire inside my head of sort of who I was and where I was headed. So, and as we all know, with ambition comes conflict. So this is where I learned sort of that life lesson of your reality is not lining up with what I had in my head is sort of this utopian ideal of being the best at this, the best at that. I'm going to be an A student. I'm going to understand English and math and science, and I'm going to be the valedictorian, and I am just going to do it. This, was, this is exactly what I thought was going to happen. But then I get introduced into the school system. And I get introduced into especially math and reading. And in a very short amount of time, I feared the classroom. I feared the classroom because, and I don't know, I'm sure some of you felt this way, 
But I was terrified by the fact that a teacher would actually call on me in class to read a paragraph out of the book because then people would probably laugh at me because I was a really slow reader and I would, I would stumble uh, on my words because I was, I was just nervous that way. Or heaven forbid in math class, which happened, happened more often than not, the teacher would call on me to go up to the blackboard to solve a problem that I had absolutely no idea how to solve even though we were on that unit for weeks. It was absolutely a foreign language to me. So this, so this personal empire that I sort of built in my head, the empire came and started crumbling all around me. The empire struck me big time. Anyone familiar with the Scantron sheet? So all of a sudden, my anxiety of not only having to get up in front of a class to do a problem or, or read a paragraph out of, out of our textbook, now all of a sudden, it, I had to deal with the fact that I had to retain this information and actually regurgitate it in one hour, if that, so tested over and over and over again on performance and how you're doing. And the thing that was interesting about that, I didn't learn at the same speed as the class was learning. It seemed like to me that everyone was on the same page and everyone was progressing at the pace that the teacher was sort of dictating. And it felt like I was just getting farther back and farther back and farther back. So what ends up happening is after that conflict and I start, okay, I got to pick myself up by the bootstraps here and do something about this. Well, other people started to help me along with that conversation. In that conversation, I was really encouraged because now the Calvary was, was on the way. And the interesting thing about it is, is I actually knew that I was really failing miserably in math. And my teacher knew I was miserably failing at math. And I felt to me that it was our dirty little secret. Nobody else knew that except, except us. But at that time, the equation that I grew to know, very familiar, is teacher plus phone equals parents. <laughs> so, so all of a sudden now, now my parents are part of that story of trying to help me understand how they can better my, my math score. Because that's, at that time, that's what it was. It was like, how are you performing on this test or on this quiz or on this homework? And again, it became a, a relatively daunting challenge. So what do they do? So they joined me in that conversation, but other people joined. And the person that joined was a tutor. So we ended up having to, you know, out of our pocket, have to pay for a tutor to come to our house once a week. But here's the, here's the interesting thing that was my overarching dilemma, is my teacher, I only had the teacher one hour a day. And guess what? That teacher also had 25 students in my class. So the reality of me getting any kind of one-on-one -on -one with that teacher was very, very little. It didn't happen too often. And my parents, well, one, they weren't at school with me all day. And two, my mom, stay-at-home mother, had a lot of other things that were going on with having to run my older brother and younger brother places and myself. And, and she, like, I come by my, my lack of math skills from my mother. <laughs> so if I actually sat down and said, I have a problem, she's like, you have to wait till your dad gets home. Now, my dad was really actually very good at math, but as a guy that traveled all the time, my time with these three characters in my story was actually pretty limited. So, so what ends up happening in that situation is they start moving out of that conversation, and there's very small touch points throughout the day within that conversation. So what happens is now I am left by myself with the books, self-educating myself or trying to self-educate myself. So here's the interesting thing. When I would leave the class, 
or the tutor would leave the home, I would forget what I was just taught. There was no retention other than go look at, go look at a book. So it was very, very, very difficult. So in that, in that situation, for me, it felt as though that that connection with people that were actually helping me. So I was very encouraged early on in that story of like, okay, now my parents are involved, the teacher's involved, I got a tutor. So I had a lot of people involved with that conversation. So I was really encouraged by that. All of a sudden, to feel as though because of, of time and my connection with those people that were supposed to help me was so limited, that that connection, that lifeline for me was gone. Even though there were touch points, it still felt like I was alone and isolated. How many people have felt this way before? So fast forward. An Amazon education. So several years ago, well, years ago now, when Amazon sort of came on the scene and technology really, really, really started to, to change the way people were, were interacting with, with each other, um, I got thinking, I was like, wow, it's pretty interesting what, what Amazon is, is doing and what they're doing. And I know everyone is, has heard about this and has probably done the exact same thing is when you go and purchase something on Amazon, it does a couple things. It recommends other products that you may like based on what you just purchased. And if you're a repeat customer of Amazon, they try to hold your hand through that experience a little bit and say, hey, people that bought this also bought these. So what that experience ended up doing is it actually became very personal. And there's a level of personalization to that experience. So as I start thinking through education and I start thinking through, wow, how technology is actually a powerful tool, you start looking at things like, like an Amazon and start thinking like, well, can, can education be personal? Can there be a level of personalization to the way that I'm learning, to the speed that I'm learning? to the people that I'm learning with, that to me is, is absolutely fascinating, especially for the career that I'm in. I'm, you know, I'm an employee of a company called Universal Mind, and, and we build great experiences. Everything from automotive industry to education and everywhere in between. And the first rule of experience design is never make the user feel stupid. And when you start looking at technology and sort of the digital landscape, a lot of people were really, really experimenting early on with, with complex architecture inside of educational environments. So people would get lost because they tried to be so creative with the way you would navigate an experience and get in and out of, of tools and all of a sudden people dropped off really quickly because it made them feel stupid. It made me feel like this. So we're gonna do something here real quick. We're gonna get interactive on you. So, so everyone, if you can put your, your arms out like this. I feel like the zombie guy that I saw last night walking down the street. So what I want you to do now is turn so thumbs are down, and now what I want you to do is cross like this. So you're, so you're intertwined. Yep, no, I think you got it. No, that's good. Okay, so now if you've done that right, you'll be able to do this. Okay, so for me, for me, some of you got it. For me, that's what school was. They were being very methodical and saying, do this, and do this, and do this. And when you do that, you should, you should get this. 
and I felt as though I was always doing something wrong. But yet it sounded so simple. Like why couldn't, was it something wrong with me? Why, why couldn't I follow what they were doing? It seemed like everyone else was progressing and doing that thing that got them to the answer. But why not me? So it made me feel really stupid. So as we start diving into sort of the technology stuff, that's what I get really excited for, especially in the education environment, is how can we actually simplify the experience for a student or the experience of just learning so it doesn't make someone feel stupid? Because when you make someone feel stupid, like I felt every single day in math class, you disconnect completely from that experience. Or hopefully you'll go try to find that somewhere else. But the reality is most students actually just give up. And that's when you hear everyone say they just sort of fell through the cracks. So in Amazon education, this idea of, of how personalization, how technology actually has the ability to help students. And I say students, not as you know, elementary, high school, college, I'm talking about everybody. Because everybody, what technology today has done, it has enabled everybody to learn anything they want, anytime, anywhere, independent of the device or technology that they're using. They have access to learn, 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 learn. And it's only getting faster, it's only getting bigger and more robust, so information is gonna be catered more personal. It's, it's really, really exciting. And for a lot of educators, it's a very scary prospect as well. Well, now we get into gamification. Who's heard of gamification before? Right, mo- most of you have. So who here is actually a, a gamer? Okay, a couple of you. So I'm not, I'm not like a huge gamer, but Games teach us a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. The automotive industry, when I did some projects with them, what they will do is they will actually go and they will buy the latest, greatest Xbox with the latest, greatest automotive game that's on there, and they will look at how the game designers have actually designed the controls for games. Because in games, you're going like this, and you need, you need to keep your eye on the road. But in the gaming environment, they do a really good job of making sure you have instant, visible access to the information that you need without crashing your car or really diverting your attention away from the road. So games teach us a lot about interaction. It teaches us a lot in how we are actually learning. And an interesting thing is um, World of Warcraft. Who's actually heard of World of Warcraft before? So most of you have heard it. Has anyone played it out of the gamers here? Nobody. So, so I'm not a gamer, but I got a 30-day trial of World of Warcraft when it first came out several years ago, just to see what the buzz was all about. So the interesting thing about World of Warcraft is you actually can play it solo up to a certain point. Once you start, the gamification comes in, once you start leveling up or reaching a new plateau or there's a new goal that needs to be reached, you no longer can do it by yourself. You can no longer proceed within the game by yourself. Because one, you'll die every time, and two, you'll never reach your goal. So what something like a World of Warcraft is teaching, and a lot of different games like that, is how we work together to accomplish common goals. It's sort of that Montessori uh, approach a little bit in education of, guess what? We're not going to give you all of the answers but we're gonna let you sort of create this community of people around you that you can explore other options. And you can start figuring these things out on your own in somewhat of a controlled environment. But it's how we work together to accomplish certain goals. So we're starting to see in the gaming environment, we're actually starting to see how education is actually playing out a little bit 
and we are being educated without even knowing it. Such as that World of Warcraft reference, the Nike Plus. Has anyone used Nike Plus before? Okay, a couple of you. So for the people that don't know what Nike Plus is, um, there's a lot of different variations of it, but there's essentially a small little chip um, that goes into the bottom of a, of a Nike shoe. Now for people that don't have that, there's other ways that you can sort of rig that up on your shoelace or what have you. But the, the idea is, and they've partnered with Apple, so it actually is sort of a transmitter to, um, to your digital device. So when you're actually running, it actually tracks how fast you're going, how far you're going. It actually will track the, um, not only the, the pace, but what song you were listening to um, when you started actually running faster. So it catalogs all this information and it becomes social as well because now you can actually invite your friends and other people in your community to challenge them to a run. And hey, this is our goal and we're setting a date for it and we're setting all these other parameters around it and, and you can actually challenge other people. So what it's doing is, is you're learning in sort of this environment of entertainment when it comes to your health. Um, look at the Wii. Has anyone ever played the Wii before? So a lot of the health things in, in the Wii, you're, you're actually being very healthy by actually engaging in this sort of social aware um, gamification, if you will. Um, this one right here, does anyone know what that, that one is? Zombie run. Zombie run, all right. So, so this one, has all the potential of being this remarkable tool. Again, and I, I don't want to be too um, heavy handed with the, the health and wellness kind of applications, but the, the ramifications of something like this, I'm not a runner. Is anyone here a runner? Okay, quite a few of you. But, but for me, there has to be a pretty compelling reason for me to get my butt out of my work chair or out of the couch. And for me, when that tool came available for my smartphone, what this is, is it actually hooks your music into an experience that is terrifying, yet has so much potential and is very cool. So what it does is you're, you're actually part of this larger storyline that's going on and you have to sort of reach certain um, certain markers within sort of your running route at certain times and, and what have you. But along that run, your music will be interrupted by sort of the leader of, of your sort of community. And that voice will say, you know, zombies are right behind you. You got to pick up the pace. And you can actually hear the zombies now. Like there, you can hear them. It sort of like has this distance kind of, kind of effect. But if you slow your pace down instead of pick it up, they're getting closer. So, so all of a sudden, you're like, holy crap. Like, it's dark out, which, which if you do that in the dark, it actually makes it even more interesting. <laughs> um, you're picking up the pace for no other reason than to get away from the zombies, but also to reach sort of these virtual mile markers. So, so it's, it's amazing. And then after, after that experience, you can go on your phone or online and actually see where your pace picked up, you know, what things were happening at, at that time. Did you actually reach your goal? And you can share that out with your, with your community. So, so learning is, is happening in these in incredibly unique ways um, about ourselves, about the communities we live in, uh, about subjects, about education. We're learning in ways that, that we never thought of before. Um, before I had kids, you sort of understood my story. It was, it was sort of horrific when it came, came to math. But for my kids, the tools that were, you know, that are available to them, you know, um, when my oldest was, was very young, you know, the, the Leap Pad came out, and then you had like the Leap Pens and stuff like that. And, and to me, that was, like, that was like gold. I mean, it really wasn't the Leap Paper and all that kind of stuff that like really sort of, you know, engage your, your, your student or your kid or your classroom in, in unique ways that we never saw before was really, really compelling. And from those perspectives, 
I knew that like technology was going to absolutely revolutionize what you guys do on a day in and, and day out basis. So you have this gamification piece. But then everyone here, I assume, has heard of the word and has experienced the, the YouTube phenomenon, right? I mean, this, this right here is sort of the big target right now. Um, even Zuckerberg at uh, Facebook is saying that the next th big thing is, is video. That this is it. And these, and these guys and a whole host of other sort of video-esque sharing services were on the sort of the bleeding edge years back when they came uh, with this offering. But in the educational environment, um, this is really, really, really changing the game in a really, really big way. And, and in one way that I think is really interesting is what I talked about earlier when I left the classroom or the tutor left my home, I forgot things. It's because I didn't have access to that information anymore. I, I had the book, but maybe the teacher explained it a little bit differently or gave us some like secret little tips of how to do this or that. I didn't retain that stuff. The book didn't share those with me either. So again, it was sort of going down this rabbit hole. But for something like a, a YouTube, you can, you can pause it, you can stop it, you can watch it when you want, you can rewind it, you can go back. It's instant access to information anywhere, anytime, independent of, of your device. And oh, by the way, you're no longer alone in that quest for knowledge because as video and as backend systems get more robust, um, this is becoming so incredibly critical for education and how the social aspect of videos is permeating everything right now. So you're no longer alone in your quest for knowledge like I was when I was younger. And here's just a perfect, very real world, recent example of this, is who uses Bing as their, as their search engine? How many uses Google? Okay, so 99%. You might get an extra point for saying Bing. <laughs> I don't use Bing either. Um, but what Bing does that's very, very interesting here is it's not just a search. It actually starts connecting you with people that you already know, with information that you're actually looking for. So if you actually are on Facebook and you have X amount of friends on Facebook, the majority of the people on Facebook, maybe you're not perfect friends with them, but you know them, you know of them, you know if they're smart, you know if they can add value, you're friends with them for a certain reason, right? But when you start searching for something and it's pulling in the people that you believe in, that are friends with you, that can help, all of a sudden, this over here is great information and it's quick. So a couple weeks ago when Apple actually made some of the updated announcements, did anyone watch that? The, you know, the new iPad and stuff like that. So, so what ended up happening after I watched that is I, I went and just did a search on iPad. And I didn't even say iPad, you know, the new iPads or whatever. I just said iPad. And, and this was the result. Great information, but one of my good friends here actually had a lot of stuff that he already knew about it. There were blog posts that, that he had about not only the legacy iPads, but the new ones coming up. He's a photographer, so this one right here, it says, you know, Brian has posted a photo um, of the iPad. Here it says, you know, want to share with your friends, see what they know. So it, it's, it's amazing now how technology you can start seeing it from sort of the early stuff um, with like the Amazon of being able to make your experience personal. All of a sudden, this steps it up even one step further, where now not only is it personal because you're getting great personal results in your searches, but now it's bringing in your social network and that landscape of people that, that could be potential experts or teachers 
or educators or people that you can actually get information, trusted information out of because you have an intimate connection with them. That's amazing. That, that's absolutely amazing. So if a teacher is having an assignment at, at night and all of a sudden something of this caliber of, well, what if there was a tool that you had in your classroom that you know, maybe you were actually, you videotape all of your, all of your classroom lectures maybe. And there's a place for, for students to go and, and, and relook at, at that information and connect with the kids that are in their classroom that are struggling with the same conversations. And oh, by the way, the teacher can now go back and say, oh my gosh, the lecture that I did yesterday, 32 out of 32 students went back and watched it. So we're not going to move on to the next one until I ask some pretty pointed questions of like, hey, I, I noticed that last week there was only one or two people that went and viewed the lecture, and you did pretty well on the tests. But yesterday's lecture, all of you went and looked at it. So let's have a conversation about what you didn't understand or if there are some theories or things that, that we just need to discuss a little bit longer. So, so things like this where it's really connecting you with... Um, with people that you know. I think Bing is doing a, a fantastic job, and they're doing a really good job at their, their marketing of those as well. And that being said, that connection when I was younger that was lost, when I walked out of the room or when the tutor left the home and I was only left with my book to figure it out, and that connection was lost, that connection now never leaves. It is always accessible to you. It doesn't matter the time of day. It doesn't matter where you're at. For the most part, it doesn't really matter what device or technology platform that you're on. That information is accessible to you. You have the videos that you can watch. You can stop. You can pause. You can rewind. You can go back until you master that particular topic. You have tests that you can take online that will track how you're doing. Are, are you doing well? Are you keeping up? Are you falling behind? You've got websites with uncountless information at your fingertips. You've got your social network that is there from teachers and administrators to, to peers that can help continue that story, that conversation, can help you along the way. And it's pretty much independent of the tools that you have available to you today with tablets and smartphones and desktops. Um, it's only going to get bigger, better, faster, more, more robust. So that connection to your education, to your student's education, to your education, never, ever leaves. In fact, right now, it's only growing. It's only growing. So, so here's a couple companies. Who has heard of at least one of these companies? So almost all of you. So what I've been saying for the last half hour or so is this whole idea of, uh, of sort of that video integration and, and YouTube and, and all of those social types of things. Um, Coursera, Khan Academy, probably Khan Academy would be my guess is probably the one that gets the most um, verbal recognition from people. Um, Newton, and then um, edX. Um, th these are companies, and there's a whole host of others from, from Pearson and um, HMH and, and all these other educational environments that are doing very similar things. But the amazing thing about what these companies are doing is these are lower level education all the way to higher ed education. So university level as well. So someone like um, an edX, you know, it, it's a partnership with the likes of, of MIT and Berkeley and Harvard, and and the same with all of these. You can go on and you can actually most of these. In fact, all of them, I think, except for one, you can go on and sign up for a class that starts at you know one of them for, from Harvard is starting on October 15th that goes through November whatever. I mean, these are, 
These are you know, semester-long types of classes. You're getting graded on these classes. These aren't professors that were hired specifically for online content. These are professors that are actually professors at Harvard and Berkeley and Ohio State and Penn and all of these institutions that that content is free. Those classes online are free. There's thousands. Just in these right here, there's thousands upon thousands of courses that you can take, that you can go and watch daily videos, that you get assignments from, you get graded on. Um, and at the end, for most of these, you actually get um, not only an overarching grade, you also get certificates of, of completion and other things. Now, the, the monetization of some of these tools is if you're doing good in class, at the end of it, there could actually be a, um, a work placement um, type of situation um, as well in some of these. So, so at the end, you can actually you know, look for a job and say, hey, I've, I've gone through these courses and I, I've sort of mastered these things. Um, it's absolutely fascinating to me. And wouldn't it be really cool if someday you could actually create your own degree, your own curriculum? Well, I want to be a designer. Okay, what kind of designer? Automotive designer. Okay, great. Well, did you know that Rhode Island um, Institute has, you know, RISD has a really, really, really great automotive industrial design department? Oh I, oh, I didn't know that. Well, did you know Harvard actually has um, a design and pattern class that is absolutely fantastic? And did you know Ohio State had blah, 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 and it goes on and on and on? Well, what if one day you had the ability to create your own course independent of, I'm spending $100,000 to go to Harvard? Well, no, I'm, I'm spending X amount of dollars to go and get a mastery of this skills from all of these different institutions and creating my own personal <coughs> education that's personalized for me. That's, I mean, NPR was talking about this very same thing years ago on how education has the ability to become personal and personalized for you. Because as I found out the hard way from an education perspective is not everybody works at the same pace. No, no two students are alike. Everyone is learning at, at different times and different speeds. And, and, and it's, it absolutely sucks the life out of you if you know intimately that you're sitting in the class and you don't know what's going on. But if you had tools that you could actually personalize and people could help you along the way and it becomes a social engagement, it becomes a community thing where it's, you know, it takes a village to raise, you know, a, a child kind of mentality, that's, that's absolutely amazing and that's where it is headed. So this is, you know, this is the, the edX, you know, the future of online education. I mean, you will get a, a scroll list of um, courses upon course upon course upon course, and you can search some courses as well, like find a course. And this is consistent across the board um, with these. All you have to do is, so if I, if I clicked on this for a computer science or, or any of the other ones, it actually just brings you to a landing page that says, great, register, the class starts in three weeks. That's it, and then it becomes this, this online course. My, my wife has taken, for several years, um, online math courses. Um, and, and it's amazing. And she's had to pay a pretty hefty sum because it's associated with our local college. But when you get this quality of information from the likes of a Harvard or U.S., it doesn't matter. And it's free. It's education for the masses. And you can personalize it. You can do it when you want to do it. You can do it where you want to do it. Um, my younger daughter... Her big struggle when she was much younger was, was noise. She had a humongously difficult time sitting in a class and other kids talking. So we talked to the teacher, and the teacher during, um, during homework time let her go and sit outside the classroom because she just had such a hard time concentrating. And now she's sort of over that, but the reality was is that was very different than how, how other kids were learning. Um, so it's, it's really interesting how everyone just sort of attacks this a little bit differently. 
But here's the trick with the technology stuff. The stuff that I just showed you is, is where it's headed. And not even where it's headed, it's where it is right now. You, you can already do this. Stanford sort of started to lead that charge years ago with their online courses. But it doesn't mean anything. To me, this is, this is a personal thing. To me, it doesn't mean anything if I'm going or my child is going to take a class and they're not capturing data. Because data, data equals action. And especially for the, the younger crowd, elementary, middle, high school, when you actually get really, really, really good usable data, you can act upon that data. So if there is good data associated with my lack of math skills and ability, my teacher, my parents, the people that were sort of in my network, they would have had an ability to change the course of my story. That chapter one, which was so terrifying for me, the end of my story could have ended so much different. But even through high school and college, math was a struggle. Because everything was so disconnected. My eighth grade teacher was disconnected from me going from middle school to high school. There was no, there was no talking in between those, those grades. When I went to college, they didn't know that I struggled with math other than looking at my grade. Even though, so each teacher sort of had a little bit of a, a look into my struggles, but nobody talked, nobody shared information between one another. But today, my, my kids, one of them is actually interesting. She's in uh, Asia right now for the next two months, just backpacking and going through hostels. Um, and my younger one is a freshman in high school. But the way that they went through and are starting to go through high school is all based on technology. They don't bring books home. Every single book that they have is online. They can do practice tests online, all the stuff that you guys probably know pretty intimately. But it is about the data. It is about how that data is being fed to those stakeholders. So it changes the story. It becomes sort of a shared understanding between all of the stakeholders in a child's life, in a child's educational path. And the cool part about it, I'm glad most of you are educators here, because it's you guys that are helping to change that story of my child, of your students. And if you actually have insight if you have some easy way of looking at an infographic on Christian Sailor, you would instantly understand where my struggle points are with math. And because you had that insight and because you actually shared it out with administrators and educators and parents and tutors and, and people in that network, you can act upon it you can help change my story from being one of fear and trepidation of sitting in a classroom to someone that gets it and understands it. And oh, by the way, might be someone that someone else comes to to look for help. So the insight, that shared understanding. And there is one company that is doing that really well, that is changing the game big time. So we partnered with this, um, this company out in, um, I would say Colorado, but it's Boston. Um, but we were working for the Colorado Department of Education. And now it's turned into something way bigger um, than I anticipated early on. But now it's starting to sort of make its way into other states uh, like Nevada and Colorado and, and others. 
and, it, and it's called School View. What it does is it gives you sort of that, that broad overview at like a district level, so you can see all these bubbles that actually give um, some indication of sort of all the schools within a certain district and actually how they're doing in, in subjects such as math, reading, and writing. And the interesting thing about what it does then is that actually um, you can actually get down into the student view. So you can actually get to that single student within a school, within a district. And you can actually see how that person over time has been doing in those three subject or the core subject matters. But what you actually get here is you actually have the ability to look across the district to be able to actually see how, how those districts are doing within um, these certain subject areas. And you have a lot of different filtering. But to make this a little less overwhelming, let's actually get rid of um, some of these. So now we can actually see um, something a little bit more uh, usable. So as we're starting to roll through, we can actually start seeing the schools here um, for the middle school. And you can roll over and make those selections. Or, or what I can do is I can just roll over here, and I can actually get information specific to that particular school. And again, a lot of this is getting cut off, so I apologize. So you can look at different schools, such as male and female, race and ethnicity, and how, how different um, races are actually doing on these levels as well, which is really nice. Again, it's all about that information and that data. And then what we um, have the ability to do is we can actually dive into that specific school. So you can see within that school there are three grades. So we've got sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. I can actually go and view it by whatever I want to view it by, or I can just simply double tap on that to now bring up all the students that are within that particular grade for that particular school. So at each level, from that macro view, the district view, again, you have a lot of filtering capabilities and what have you, but then it starts getting into the things that are really starting to matter to the, to the individual educator and being able to look at students and student views. Well, and since this one popped up as Christian Frazier, and Christian is my first name, let's take a look at, at this student. So being able to look at this student over time in math reading and writing and where the proficiency levels um, are actually at um, from, as you can see, grade three all the way up now to, to grade eight. But for, for educators being able to see you know, hey, how, how is Christian actually doing in, in these areas over time gives us such a great indication uh, of where we can actually help. And then you can actually go and you can view a student report, which basically you can share it out. You know, on the top left, you can share it out with a PDF or, or other ways to share it, which basically then goes into the whole stakeholder um, mentality. So now it's parents, it's educators, it's people that can help make decisions based on his performance over time. And then the, the last piece is really just, just this to end with. So I want to challenge you to actually look at technology as a way to change or enhance the story that's happening in your class and what's happening in the life of, of your student. And my last question is, what, what is your story? I shared with you my story, but what's your story? What kind of things are you actively involved with today that help to influence this conversation and moving forward? Are you involved with technology? Do you find technology is a, is a hindrance or an enabler right now? What is, what is your story and what role are you playing in the lives of your children, your students? Are you actively involved in that conversation? So thank you so much for your time. Sorry about the little hiccup there at the end, but thank you.